Hello, good morning to everybody, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on COVID-19's impact on consumer behavior and the UK food service industry. My name is Carolina Otero. I'm the head of insights for Nestlé Professional in UK and Ireland. This session was organized as part of Nestlé Professional's Always Open For You initiative. We partner with Mintel to run this webinar exclusively for Nestlé Professional current and potential customers to support you with relevant insights that will help you navigate the challenging situation and take informed decisions for your business. Most of you probably know Mintel. Mintel is a world leading market intelligence agency and one of Nestlé's key partner agencies. Our presenters today are Jack Duckett, Associate Director for Consumer Lifestyles Research, who is going to cover some of the changes we've seen in consumer lifestyles since the lockdown and Trish Caddy, Senior Food Service Analyst, who is going to cover the impact of COVID-19 on the food service industry. As you know, there are a lot of uncertainty regarding what to expect in the coming months. So what the team is going to share are some of the insights available at this point, what we are seeing happening and shaping as restrictions ease, and some expectations of what may come. In the coming months, we'll, con we'll continue to look at how things evolve and look for ways to share those insights with you. So please send us your feedback on this webinar and your interest in future sessions. A few practical points before I pass to the Mintel team. Uh, for this webinar, we have booked an hour with the last 15 minutes allocated to a Q&A. So please send your questions to the presenters using the chat box. We will share the deck with all of you after the session, so uh, be reassured about that. And then also, as Franz said, the webinar is being recorded, so then we're, you're going to have the recording available to also share with, uh, with some other team members or also to listen to, to it again. So the access of, to the recording would be the same link that you used to register. So thanks again for making the time this morning to join us. And now I pass over to Jack. Thank you very, very much. So um, it seems somewhat basic, but something that we've been really, really focused on at Mintel since the outset of this is trying to get an understanding of how worried people are about COVID-19. It's actually trickier to do than it sounds, but something that has been really important part of our research across the markets we work in. So our very first question was really designed to root out how consumers are, how worried people are about being exposed to the virus. And we could see that the easiest way to do this would be to ask people on a scale of one to five. So we asked people where they would put their anxiety, one about being exposed to the virus, one not worried at all, through to five being extremely worried. Now, what we've seen across the last uh, few weeks is that that anxiety has followed very much the case of in fact, a few months, very much the track line of case numbers. So as case numbers have gone up, so too has consumer anxiety. And I guess across the last seven weeks in the UK, as case numbers have fallen, so too has consumer anxiety. But I guess what I want to make my point from this first uh, slide here is that actually, despite what the, the media is keen to pitch to us all, people are actually still quite worried. 53% of all adults put their worry about being exposed to the virus at a four or five. So those, those two high levels. In fact, 30% are still very clear they are extremely worried about being exposed to the coronavirus. So it's important to see that people are still very, very um, concerned by this. Now, there's, of course, variation amongst different demographic groups. You see that anxiety falls typically amongst younger consumers, 35%, so roughly a third are in that four or five. The vast majority of this group put their anxiety to three, with some putting it at one or two. Uh, and of course, anxiety rises about being exposed amongst older consumers, the most vulnerable. But generally speaking, it's, it's quite a consistent thing. People are very worried about this, about the virus, and it's going to keep people from returning to life too quickly, I would say. If we pop to the next chart, actually, Trish. Next slide. What's really interesting also is it's not just um, people's concerns about being exposed to the virus, but also the threat the virus poses to their lifestyles. You don't need me to tell you that our lifestyles have changed crazily over the last few months. Life has gone from being an active, out of home, on the go experience to being very much based in the home. We are stuck in our houses for most people um, nearly all the time. And although things are changing slightly, people are still mostly, again, despite, despite what our, our media always tells us, most people are still very much sticking to their home space. And you can see that's been quite a shock. So on a se separate question, we asked people how concerned they are about how much it will impact their lifestyle. You can see again, 
over half, very similar portion to what we saw about their exposure anxiety, are concerned about what this um, about you know what this could mean for their lifestyles, and that's something that's not likely to go so quickly. In fact, the line showing the slowdown this is much slower than it is for, for exposure concerns. As people still don't feel secure about their lifestyle changes, what's happening next? We still don't know. Now, in order to keep away from the virus, if we move to the next chart, Trish. We can see that this is really starting to come through in people's behaviours. People are starting to make behaviour changes to keep themselves protected, to keep, contain the stability they really, really need. And in fact, one of the biggest areas of change we've seen is when it comes to their shopping habits. The next chart shows us that 48% of all adults are avoiding using cash where possible. People really keen, it's been a huge boost for digital spending, people really, really keen to keep away from cash they could get this from. Equally, a similar proportion, nearly half all adults trying to limit the amount of time they're spending on store. I think what's really interesting, 41% of all adults are shopping more online. If we go to the next chart, Trish. Now that's a really interesting one. That's something that we've seen across all of our markets and most interestingly across all of our age groups. People are very quick to embrace online. Now early on in this, this was not so much about safety as it was about getting hold of things. We all remember those images and in fact those were common across the, the world of shelves without products on them, people not able to get hold of um, particularly loo roll. But in fact it was for a whole host of products and people really panicked. I know a friend who couldn't get hold of palm bears for their child and lost their mind, went to buying them in bulk from Amazon. So it does happen. Anyway, the point is, is that people therefore went online to get the things they absolutely needed, whether it was masks, loo rolls, all the things they felt they absolutely needed to keep their lives going on track. And that was seen across all age groups. And it's something that could prove, in fact, the big success story of this whole downturn. Lots of people who previously didn't like shopping online, including shopping for products they didn't like to online, beauty, personal care, healthcare, were forced to do so. And in fact, finding it easier, this is something we could see they continue to do going forward. If we go to the next chart, Trish, what we can actually see here is another change is this obsession with packaging. We've had the last few years, people were getting more and more worried about the environment and excess packaging. And yet now where hygiene is a real concern, we see 63% of all adults saying they prefer products with packaging as they think it will protect contents from contamination. In fact, in this uh, same question, we asked people whether they think it's more important to look after hygiene or, or to reduce disposable packaging. And half of all adults said that it's more important to reduce, um, to, to protect hygiene currently than it is to reduce packaging. So you can see that tie between the environment and packaging. Currently, packaging and our desire for hygiene is winning out. Now we move to the next chart, Trish. Something that we always look at at Mintel is the financial impact and how this is impacting consumer sense of the economy and their finances. The next chart, Trish, shows people just how glum it is. I promise you I've got a brighter second half of my presentation, but things have to, things have got really negative when it comes to people's outlook for the economy and their own finances. In fact, I would say at this point nearly everyone, 84% of all adults say the outbreak will have a negative impact on the UK's economic growth. In fact, that is a net of extremely negative and somewhat negative and around 43% believe it will have an extremely negative impact on the UK's economy. People are in no doubt about just how bad this could be for the UK economy. And we can see similar concerns there for unemployment. The housing market is a very similar number. Um, People are marginally more optimistic when it comes to their own financial situation. That's something we see always when we ask this question, whether it's about Brexit or the election, or in this case, COVID-19. But the point is that people have more knowledge of their own finances and therefore are typically going to be more optimistic as they feel more in control. But when it comes to the, uh, the economy, it can't get much, uh, much bleaker at this point. And if we go to our next slide, Trish, we can start to see why people are so bleak. Now, a positive reading of this chart will see us lean on the left-hand side. We can see that roughly two thirds of all adults are either about the same financially since the start of the outbreak, or even a little bit better off, all those people who've been lucky enough to be able to make some savings. But ultimately, uh, a more realistic and, and sort of hard-hitting look at this chart takes us to the right-hand side. Just over a third of all adults say their finances are a little bit worse off or much worse off since the start of this outbreak. This is going to drive a real focus on value across every market, whether it's grocery, food service, leisure. People are going to be thinking very carefully about their finances until they start to feel an improvement. If we go to the next chart, Trish, we can see in fact this is already coming through to people's purchases. 30% of all adults have put off making major purchases as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak. This is consistent, this is what's going to be driving slowness in the housing market, in the car market, in any of those big, even the tech market when it comes to TV sort of seeing a fall off. People are worrying about bigger picture, uh, purchases because they're feeling so crowded by the smaller ones. So things like food, beauty, personal care, all those essentials that they're starting to worry about. Certainly they're not going to be thinking about bigger picture purchase at this point. That said, I'm the person who's still trying to buy a house in the middle of this, so maybe I'm not a typical consumer. 
If we pop to the next uh, chart, Trish, I'm going to give you some positives before I clear off and hand over to, to, to Trish, because I think that's probably useful. If we move to the next chart, Trish, something we have seen across this period is a real focus on what people are doing in their homes and habits are changing in some really exciting ways, whether it's using video calls, whether it's um, learning the piano all over again, or whether it's doing more cooking at home. We can see here right up top, uh, a huge number of people are doing more cooking in home, exploring that in home. Now, some of that, of course, is that we simply had our lives forced in home. There's, of course, an element of it. But it's also that people are finding enjoyment in it. We have some additional data, people doing more scratch cooking, where a lot of people have found themselves having fractionally more time, uh, largely due to lack of commute, they're taking that time to enjoy some real health parameters. You can see taking part in more workouts, doing more home cooking. If we move to the next chart, Trish, another major trend that's come out of this is this enjoyment, of this realization of the importance of family. We've always known family and friends are important, but now we've had the ability to see them and spend time with them ripped away from us. We've all panicked. 30% of all adults say that staying in touch with family and friends has become a higher priority since the start of the outbreak. My big takeaway for the food service market is that this is a core marketing messaging going forward after this outbreak. This ability to spend time and to reconnect friends and family, that is right at the center of what the food service market, certainly dining in, but even and, uh, and including takeaways is about. And as people are allowed to spend more time together, I think this will be a really important togetherness trend that sits at the heart of the industry. If we move to the next uh, chart um, block, Trish, we can see that health has become really important to people. I would hope so, as this has been a major threat to consumer health. And it's it's actually in, encouraging to see that people are looking at this and thinking, I need to prioritise my health more. For a third of all adults, they say that exercise has become a higher priority since the start of this outbreak. For 31%, diet has become a higher priority. These are much higher amongst younger adults, but they're still pretty high amongst older adults. And I think what's encouraging, if we look at the right hand side of the screen here, 10% say their appearance has become a higher priority, far, far smaller than those saying that health has become priority. This has been a big picture of the body coach of, of Joe Wicks, hugely popular Joe Wicks across this period. Health must be about health and feeling better, not just looking better. And you can see that seems to be a message that's breaking through to the consumer a good sign for those in the diet and healthy eating industry. And if we move on to the next one, uh, Trish, this is a real challenging one. 25% of all adults say that the environment's become a higher priority since the start of the outbreak. You're possibly thinking, isn't that at odds with what he just said about packaging a second ago? Well, yeah, it kind of is. Consumers are always mismatching ideas about what they say and think versus what they do. You can see they're here breaking down their recycling habits all in the name of, of, of being hygienic and yet they're all more worried about the environment. This is another one where the output is often the the responsibility comes back to companies. They themselves are worried about hygiene but they want to see the improvement continuing to be made. Those storylines we started out with before all of this started about how we were being better more ethical businesses, those are going to still be important. In fact, make, maintaining a sustained line in these across the next few months will be really important to businesses. If we move to the next chart, Trish, my final slide before I summarise, I want to give some good news, I think, to the food service market. It's, it's, it's encouraging, albeit, as Trish will point out, there are some challenges still to come. We've been asking people what they are most looking forward to doing after lockdown ends. And of course, right up top there, number one, 57% spending more time with family and friends. Again, reinstating that point that after this, there's going to be huge opportunities for getting people back together. But consistently, number two, across all of, of the period we've been asking this question, we've asked this five times now, going out for a meal, it's the, the second thing people have been most looking forward to doing after lockdown ends. And you can see a little bit lower there going for a drink, and that's only been pushed out over the last few weeks by people's desperation for a haircut, as going for a DIY haircut has become less and less fashionable. So if we move on to the next, I will summarize, um, Trish. This is the end for me before I pass over. Um, there is low consumer confidence. It's not just financial, it is also about health. People are really worried, and this will be a barrier to getting life back to normality. The uh, government and industry are doing an absolutely a great job of getting people back to where they were. People are working really hard to try and get some sense of normality, but consumers aren't feeling it, I would argue. And until they feel better about it, that's a barrier to getting people back to outdoor life outdoors. We're seeing shopping habits change. And we're seeing people adapting hugely to the situation. This huge surge in online across all age groups actually is an opportunity. We would have said previously, our retail team, I know, that online retail was starting to reach, was starting to show signs that a plateau was in sight. 
I think this period has made sure that online will continue to see strong growth for the foreseeable future and engagement from all age groups is something that can be positive for the food service market too. And finally, life has moved in home. People have adapted to this life in home and taken so many positives from it. It's allowing them to be healthier, it's allowing them to spend more time with family. These are important messages for you to adapt to as an industry looking forward and seeing how you can work around that rather than pulling consumers out of home where they may not feel safe. So that's a roundup for me. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm going to pass over to Trish now, our expert in food service. Hi everyone, I'm Trish and I will be looking uh, a little bit more in depth and more category specific towards the uh, food service industry. This segment is going to be split into two parts. The first one's going to look at the here and now, what's really happened since the outbreak. And the second segment is going to focus a little bit more on the medium to long term, as well as some of the opportunities that are, that are available. Um, so next. Uh, so food service, what has happened so far? So let's have a look at how lockdown has changed consumer habits. Um, as this is a really follow up from what Jack already said. So this is a good kind of a setting the scene. 55% um, have done more cooking. 40% have stocked up on groceries as a result of COVID-19. And 63% have ordered fewer or no takeaways. So it's really quite important to understand why is it that uh, they've done so. Um, you know, when uh, we were told that restaurants had to um, shut down, uh, the, the first thing that um, everyone that was on everyone's mind was that restaurants were going to pivot to to delivery, and delivery was all, was going to be a clear winner. But in this case, um, you know, with this overwhelming 63% saying that they've done so less. Um, since the lockdown, it's is is you know it, it seems like quite a bleak uh, scenario. Um, uh, that's because um, takeaway, you know, that, that's because there were just far less options available. So, um, and uh, this consumer uh, quote, she's pretty much summed up or kind of painted that picture quite clearly for us, um, explaining to us that even though she is a uh, takeaway home delivery consumer, most of her favorite restaurants were shut during this time, and what was left was only some pizza takeaways. So much so that 38% um, of takeaway consumers ordered pizza and pasta, and it was the only sector that saw an increase in takeaway reach. So to give you some context, we asked a similar question back in August 2019. Um, only 28% of uh, British consumers said that they had ordered takeaway from pizza and pasta restaurants. Um, of course, it's not comparable, the base is slightly different, but it's still an indicator that without any competitions out there, pizza, uh, especially the ones that that, that already, um, you know, with delivery and takeout as their core business, really, you know, business as usual, basically, since the lockdown. Um, promisingly, some are building new habits. Uh, so 13% of them, uh, of 30% of British consumers said that they had ordered takeaway and home delivery more during COVID-19. And um, the, the, the interesting thing is some of them are turning to third-party delivery apps for the very first time. So this consumer here, this middle-aged consumer here, she herself has uh, you know, started ordering more from local bakeries and independent restaurants using Uber Eats, something she has never done before as well. Um, for those who have said that they had uh, ordered takeouts and home delivery more, they were um, especially more prevalent uh, amongst parents and city dwellers. Not only were they ordering more, they were also driving all day home delivery. So of course, this chart clearly shows that dinner was the most popular day part since uh, lockdown. But you could also see that these two groups were, um, you know, these two groups are the the main core groups that are driving all day home delivery as well as breakfast and lunchtime. So it kind of makes sense with, um, especially for parents with schools shifting to home-based learning, parents are more time poor than ever. Um, also, it's really important to identify that parents and city dwellers have always driven um, home delivery usage. So needless to say, the motivations are a little bit different right now. It's less so about 
them spending more time outside socializing and having active uh, leisure life and coming home late and therefore turning to these home delivery meal solutions. The motivations have diff are, have, are different, but nonetheless, they, you know, they, they have retained those habits um, from pre-lockdown, pre-COVID times. And also for city dwellers, they simply have more options in city locations. Now, we've looked at the here and now. We're also kind of anticipating what's likely to happen when lockdown measures have been lifted. So we've asked questions about um, whether you know people plan to um, eat out more or do they plan to cut back? And we found that 59% actually said that they do plan to cut back on fast food um, restaurant visits. So we started to do more category specific research. This one in particular is from our um, upcoming quick service restaurants research. So we're looking at that kind of fast food usage. And um, and it, it's quite really it's quite important to understand why is it that you know they plan to cut back on and and is there any way that we could uh, kind of persuade them to do otherwise so a follow-up question was asked why is it that you do plan to cut back on eating out eating and heading out to restaurants for a sit-down meal and um the the most the the the, the most common uh, reason was uh, that consumers are worried. Again, this follow-up from what Jack has said earlier, 48% of consumers are simply worried about catching COVID-19 from fast food venues. So you're seeing a lot more, and I believe this chart is it's only going to keep evolving with more and more technologies and cleaning solutions. So it's, it's definitely one area to look at. So disinfection, cleaning technologies are now being used to stop the spread of the virus. Now, while it's important to know the technologies that are available and to adopt some of these cleaning methods, it's um, it's also really important to show and tell customers the kind of efforts that you're putting in place to ensure the safety of your staff, um, of your customers, of your product, and your place. And and so much so that you know cleaning is now going to be a key marketing message to assuage any fears that people uh, would have about coming out, heading out to a restaurant for a sit down meal. So here we have two examples. Um, I invite you to check them out in your own time. The first one here is dishcraft. It's quite interesting. This dishcraft is 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 really kind of coming up with some. Um, it's a dish cleaning. First and foremost, it's a dish robotic dish cleaning uh, system, and it's also coming up with something that's a bit more adaptable for counter. To tops. So we might be seeing some kind of a disinfection unit on a countertop uh, really geared towards those that are using heat cups that want to revert back to the heat cups, um, just give them a quick rinse before they before these key cups or reusable cups are filled with drinks. Again, another example here on your far right is an invention by a university in Singapore. As you can see, it's a really dynamic disinfection robot. It's really kind of aimed at clearing large service areas, high touch areas like tabletops. We're likely to see more of this. And again, it's not so much about, you know, doing your due diligence. It's really about showing how you're doing it as well. And other kinds of measures include safe distancing measures. And um, again, you know, takeaway formats with no seats, you know, uh, are really well suited for this kind of physical distancing measures. Um, we're likely to see more or we're likely to see uh, kind of more ingenious methods of adapting their venue to, uh, to, to accommodate these safe distances. One example here is the Quality Chop House in London. It's now offering takeout through its restaurant patch. Now, clearly it's not a huge upheaval. It's just instead of letting people through their main entrance, it's now just selling takeout through their little window. Another example here is a food truck. This one is from the Dusty Knuckle, also in East London. It clearly has, um, you know, kind of converted its bus or a van into this, uh, you know, movable bakery. Um, the good thing about food trucks is that it mobilizes your business, um, allowing customers to, to bring, you know, this food truck into their neighborhood instead of being this destination a, you know, restaurant model where people have to come to you. So it's 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 one good way, um, you know, to to uh, mitigate the safe distancing measure. Another um, theme that we've seen is kiosks. Now, Meta in particular really likes to look at kiosks because before COVID-19, there's always been this um, kind of interest in kiosks or, or little pods, a standalone kiosk uh, at conveniently located um, 
and locations like uh, travel hubs, for example, it's really driven by people who are commuting to and from work. Now, with most of us now uh, stuck at home, there is no need for, for us to commute as much. Um, but however, a format like a kiosk can, you know, can really quite fit quite well on a high street environment, for example, where there is, uh, you know, where, where you don't really need to have any seating area, it literally is just selling, um, pick up and, and go. Um, another reason why people are planning to cut back on eating out is simply because they are cooking more. 37% of, uh, of consumers plan to cook at home more. So we, we know that the meal kit market was already growing steadily before the pandemic, and now it looks likely to grow even further as a result of more restaurants launching their own branded meal kits. Now we have an example of uh, the Dorchester's Make It Yourself boxes. So it comes with recipe cards as well as packaged ingredients. And you, so you can just effectively pre recreate a restaurant, a hot, fine dining restaurant um, meal at home. The other example is a Pizza Pilgrim's um, Nationwide Pizza and the Post. Again, it gives people that fail safe option to make, stretch their own pizza and bake their own pizza. The these brands are playing on the strength of their brand image. It really appeals to, you know, uh, loyal customers, people who are already familiar with these brands and love and, and are happy to show their support and also kind of, you know, the familiarity of a recognizable brand. So this could be something that the, you know, something for supermarkets to watch out for because these are, these brands come with a very strong um, kind of a, you know, brand, brand image and following. Um, but there is also good news. 37% uh, say that they do plan to eat in at fast restaurants more or about the same compared to before the outbreak. Now, this uh, quote here is, is pretty good as well. I like this quote really much because um, it says that, you know, clearly they have intentions to head out to eat. They're clearly missing Nando's. But there is a condition if it is safe to do so. So even for those who do plan to eat out, you need to assuage any kind of fears that they have about the venue. Now let's look at the next segment. We're now approaching into the slightly more me medium to long term. So let, we need to talk about the Mintel trend drivers. So the Mintel trend drivers were was just drivers that we we anticipated the market to you know slowly take its time to evolve over the next mm -hmm. uh, ten years. So we really like a vision for 2030. But since the pandemic, all of these drivers have been accelerated, and now we're seeing literally we're living in the future. We're seeing all of these trend drivers now come to the fore. And we're now the future is now. So um, I picked three of these trend drivers that I thought really kind of suited, really fits really well uh, within the food service sector. The first one is technology, value, and experiences. So let's get right to it. The first one is technology. How is the use of technology going to be, you know, um, helpful in combating um, COVID-19? So a follow-up from what Jax mentioned earlier about, you know, uh, people really turning away from cash. And really, I think coins and notes will become unsustainable in the long term as more people switch to contactless. 82% of Brits agree that cashless payment methods are more hygienic. So it's really about hygiene rather than the convenience of cash. So this used to be really divisive. When we ask this question before COVID-19, it tends to be the younger generation, like this um, consumer, for example, this 18 to 24 year old, it's, it's always been, they understand how to use it, they understand the benefits, for both parts, both the merchants and the consumer, but also there was another part of the market but which felt very alienated if you didn't allow uh, the use of coins and notes. Um, but right now, because of COVID, with the vast majority of Brits really recognizing recognizing the um, hygiene uh, of, of contactless, then we're likely to see less coins and notes and more contactless um, solutions couple of examples I've seen. These are from Singapore. The use of QR code to code. Now, it really helps if uh, the market or, or if these uh, apps and these uh, payment options are widespread. This is something I think the UK is a little bit behind the curve, but there are markets in the world that are way ahead of the curve and they're, you know, uh, apps like that are really quite widespread. So it's really quite easy for them to adapt that into uh, between a merchant and a consumer. So payments like using a QR code or you scan, it takes you to the merchant's um, pay, a page, a, a payment page where you make a transaction. And the other option to your right is a peer-to-peer -peer using a Google Pay, which you can do remotely as well. 
So these are options that's likely um, going to, you know, come to the fore a little bit more in the coming months and years. Um, technology doesn't always have to be shiny and intimidating. We're seeing some restaurants turning to um, traditional technology as well. Like this example from London, uh, it's inviting customers to place their orders through emails or text messaging. So really, you know, the benefits of, of inviting customers to place the orders directly to them gives them the option to take control of their e-commerce. So instead of being paying a premium to be listed in a third party delivery app, um, they, 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 you know, this is one option for them. Now it works for brands that, especially local brands with that strong community feel where the locals, you know, are very keen to support them and are actively seeking out what they're doing next. So it really works for them. Um, but it also opens up conversation. If it's text messaging or email, it really opens up that com uh, communication. It humanizes the process, something that third party delivery apps cannot offer. We're also seeing reservation apps or table booking apps shifting gears. So in um, one example is talk. Uh, instead of uh, allowing customers to book tables because restaurants are closed, they have shifted gears. It really is about utilizing existing tech um, capabilities to uh, allow customers to, instead of you know booking a table, to book their time slot for picking up their pre-orders. So again, things like that um, are really good at crowd controlling as well because you can stagger people's collection and therefore it minimizes any kind of cluster or overwhelming response. Now, next theme is value. So let's look at COVID-19's impact on value for money and accessibility. So value is no longer just about what's cheap and what's good. It really is about what feels right, what feels good, um, and how it can help people or make their lives easier. First and foremost, we need to talk about the, our love for all things British. Um, the idea of a restaurant selling grocery is now an established trend. We, we, we saw that first with Leon when it converted all of its restaurants to sell groceries. Um, and we asked the question if this is something they would like to see. 58% of British consumers agree that restaurants should continue to offer groceries even after COVID, um, even after uh, lockdown restrictions as well. Um, not only, uh, you know, selling groceries boosts revenue, it really promotes that local farmer and supplier. It really bridges that gap between the local produce, local farmers, local suppliers, and the consumers as well. Um, so one example here is a coffee shop in Belfast that's um, offering these kind of meal, uh, not meal kits, these are ingredient boxes. So uh, it used, I think it started out as a kind of a solution for redirecting excess of surplus that's meant for the kitchen. So the kitchens are closed and they're not having you know, there's the, they're not making enough meals to justify all these ingredients coming to the kitchen. So redirecting these surplus ingredients to uh, consumers. But now consumers having had that taste of that restaurant um, ingredients and they're kind of really kind of wanting more. It's really whet their appetite for more. And it really ties in with our love for all things British. So another one is Simon Rogan. He's also offering his farm veg boxes, you know, his farm produce in a form of veg boxes. Um, ready meals is also another innovation that's coming out from the food service sector. Some restaurants are pushing into that ready meal space with their own range of supermarket product. So it's something for supermarkets to look out for as well, because it could potentially, you know, eat into their market share. Uh, one example is Coat. It's got ready to bake meals. Um, another example is this delivery only Japanese brand that's offering the option to buy frozen meals. The good thing about frozen meals is you pick and choose what you want and you can store it in your freezer. Uh, it minimizes the need for multiple deliveries as well. It's also, an, you know, a, a kind of a good alternative to cooking. And the third option is uh, to go, ready to go, uh, uh, sorry, grab and go. So Spring is a restaurant at Somerset House. Um, it's decided to come out, launch a range of uh, food to go. Uh, so these ready meals are now sold in a little cute little um, supermarket in Notting Hill. Um, when we talk about value, we need to talk about what adding value means to consumers. Um, here we are seeing operators uh, having to add value. So what, what does that really mean? Value meals, set meals, price bundles. These are some examples of really kind of giving people that sense of 
Jing, thanks for your thought, basically. Um, this is really interesting as well. Uh, from lessons learned from the last recession, we saw that it really badly hit the fine dining sector because, you know, banks collapsing and a lot of these lunchtime expenses were, you know, uh, culled. Uh, so this time around, we're seeing incredibly a lot of, a, a lot of uh, innovations coming up from the uh, fine dining sector. So this one, um, the first one is Davis and Brooke. Uh, it's a restaurant that, in Claridge's, so it's being marketed as a Claridge's, but we also know that it's recipe from Davis and Brooke to go fried chicken meal. So if they're coming up with um, a, a comfort food that is in a, that's portable, that people understand. Um, to some, 35 pounds may be a bit steep, but also it's, it, it can also be seen as a treat. So we'll look a little bit more at what treats mean and how important it is. So for somebody who may not uh, you know, normally go to Claridge's for a meal, actually having a 35 pounds uh, meal deal does sound like a kind of viable, kind of you know, value for money. It's kind of worth, it's coming from a high end restaurant. Another example is Cloud Boss at Bibendum. He's come up with a daily change in set menu for 30 pounds. Uh, again, what these high uh, what these fine dining restaurants are doing is that they're expanding their customer base to include people that wouldn't normally come to their restaurant in a normal situation. Also, the days of saying our, you know, uh, pub foods are not, you know, you know, our food's not deliverable. Uh, I think those days are gone. It, it really is a time to deliver. So especially for the pubs, um, we've always known that consumers really do want to see more pubs offer delivery in, you know, pre-COVID times. Um, but pubs have always maintained pub foods need to be experienced in pubs, and which is true. Pubs is all about that social element of of, of eating and uh, you know socializing with friends over food and drink, but with pubs really you know having to take their time to reopen, um, it's quite important to pivot to take away to stay to to you know stay relevant and meet consumer needs. So it's a couple of examples here is one local pub in Bali that's offered that's been offering takeaway van, uh, menus since I think you know about early April, and Green King as well recently launched its delivery services uh, middle of May. So with more people experiencing pub takeaways, they're likely to expect pubs to continue this service um, even after COVID. Also, I'd like to talk about collectives. Really, it's a time for less competition and more collaboration because, co you know, um, because it's, it's, it's really about that um, collectiveness, that kind of collaboration spirit that is going to help the broader eating out market, and that is what's really quite important right now. So the collective mindset of food halls is worth uh, paying attention to. Like this one in um, Liverpool's Celtic market, what they've done is they've pulled together the joint forces, and you're able to order any food you want from any of these traders within the Celtic um, market. So again, it, it you know, it really kind of just is a sign of more things to come, more collaboration to come is a good indicator. Now we go on to experiences. So the resurgence of eating out as a treat in the age of COVID-19. So eating out is now a treat. 35% of Britons say that the desire to treat themselves has been the most influence on what they decide to eat and drink since the start of COVID-19. So really the resurgence of eating out as a treat it is, is, it is really no longer about the convenience of a takeout or grabbing a bite. Those days are, well, temporarily gone for, for now, uh, but rather it's more, instead of being more spontaneous, it's more planned. It's about planning your, your next meal. It's a special occasion and let's plan a takeout or let's plan, a, you know, a, a, let's, 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 let's head out to a special restaurant for a special experience. Um, and so for that, we need to talk about premiumization. So with restaurants, the, these guidelines, you know, there, there's so many guidelines. Is it one meter or two meters? While people work out their own guidelines, we know that restaurants have to or are forced to operate on a much smaller capacity. So they have options. They could focus on turning tables. So instead of giving people the flexibility or the luxury of having having their meal in two hours, they've got a shot in it to a 16 minute time frame. So instead of doing that, some of some restaurants are trying to ramp up that dining experience. So one example here is San Francisco's Sons and Daughters. I invite you to check out the article in San Francisco Chronicle. It's 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 it spells out its reopening strategy, which is really quite interesting. A couple of things worth noting is that in to make up for the loss of earnings, 
um, they increased many prices. So for them, it's quite a huge jump from $140 to $175. Instead of tipping, they have increased service charge from, for them. It's 15 from 15% to 18%. So again, there are some ways to mitigate. But what they really stress on is that you, when you come to our restaurant, you'll guarantee an extraordinary experience. Also, it's um, um, no, it's it's no, you know, we, we've also got to pay attention to the rise of solo diners. So th this situation, this 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 pandemic is is quite unique from is very different from the last recession. Uh, if people lost their jobs in the cities, they could go back home. But in this this pandemic was keeping families apart. You really couldn't go back to old. So families with older parents and older adult children were kept apart. So in this case, there were these, you know, solo diners stranded, being stuck in the city locations, and therefore there are some, or there is some demand or some need for that meal for one. So you've got a couple of restaurants that are doing just that. So Bright, uh, another restaurant in East London, it's come up with meal kits for one. And Townsend is also a little restaurant uh, in East London. It's also offering meal kits with wine for one or two. Now, last but not least, this is another indication that there, there, there is this sense of collaboration mindset going on in a form of menu swaps. So this example is from Singapore. Singapore has recently collaborated with Australia. So one restaurant in uh, Singapore, Gun Ants, collaborated with an Australian restaurant to cook from each other other's menus. So as you know, travel restrictions continue, we cannot travel as travelers and chefs cannot travel to do pop-ups. This this little kind of menu swap is is quite you know it's quite a clever way to uh, you know keep keep menu options excited also for consumers to kind of, you know feel a bit excited to kind of feel like they're having something that you know well we can't visit Australia this year let's you know let, let let's 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 experience this meal instead from this local restaurant so um in summary in the short term which is what's happened already restaurants pubs um, cafes, they're gradually reopening while adhering to some social distancing guidelines. And we've seen and we know that people will be slow to resume their pre-COVID out-of-home activities. So they will definitely need a lot of reassurance in terms of hygiene and safety. In the medium term, which is where we are at now, we're kind of in the beginning of the medium term. So instead of relying on walk-in consumers, operators will need to diversify their revenue streams. We've seen all the examples like expanding their delivery and takeaway offer Offering to include ingredient boxes, meal deals, etc. And operators are also having to adopt tech solutions to improve that brand experience. It could be cashless payments or it could be just sending an email, sending a text, and open conversations, keeping that conversation um, open between uh, a merchant, between an operator, brand, and consumers. And in the longer term, um, we, we are hopeful that operators will, you know, uh, you know business will pick up in, 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 in the longer term. And, uh, but more importantly, operators will have to continue offering delivery and takeaway services, including ingredient boxes, as consumers settle into these new habits of cooking at home or ordering home delivery. And also, we uh, believe that operators will have to focus on offering high quality products at affordable prices in a bit to win back those financial stress um, consumers. This point is actually quite important as well because lessons learned from the last recession was that the, the market spoiled us with heavy discounting. So we want to avoid that. And by avoiding that, we need to justify why we've increased prices. Or if it's cheaper, then we need to explain why is it that it's cheaper, maybe because we're using less ingredients, maybe because it's takeout, maybe because it's fried chicken, but it's still uh, you know high quality goods, high quality food and drink that at affordable prices. And with that, thank you very much <laughs> for uh, letting me share this webinar with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Trish. So we are now going to take questions. So, so Trish, maybe you can just go back to, to your presentation uh, um, while, while, we, while we monitor questions. Um, we're seeing your beautiful background now. So, so please, you know, um, everyone, you know, like, you know, you have been uh, really good at using the chat box to, um, to ask the questions around the webinars. Do you... 
I mean, please feel free to, to, to have, ask any question you might have. So there was a couple of questions regarding uh, data and methodologies at the beginning of the, of the webinar. So like such as sample size and so on. So as you will get access to the slides as well as the recording, you will be able to see that at the bottom of each slide, um, there will be the sample size uh, and, and the methodology. Um, but do you have any more questions for Trish or for Jack, perhaps? Hello. So actually, we, we do have a couple of questions. So um, I have a question. Maybe it's for it's for Trish. What can food service do to promote trust in the preparation and handling of food in kitchens as consumers return to the office? Well, yeah, I think that's that was covered in um, the was it technologies when we looked at you know the kind of uh, cleaning disinfection um, solutions available uh, so I think really it, it's at this point it's um, you know it's it's really the, the, the main focus here is is not just um, knowing that you need to do something your due diligence it's really about showing and putting it very clearly in your marketing messages what are you doing to take measures so if for example, if you're operating from a dark kitchen where, you know, first and foremost, we never quite know what goes on in a dark kitchen because as the name suggests, we don't know what it is because there is no way to see what goes on in a dark kitchen. So ever so more, ever more important now, it's the, the need to put that in your marketing messages that you are, you know, the kind of measures that you're putting in place. So it's it's really about as to any fears that people might have. People, there are people who are willing to eat out but they need to know that it is safe to do so. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's really about it. So, it, you know, it's it's that, um, you know, having PPEs available for your staff, that becomes really important. But really, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's, that's definitely one starting point. Um, being able to see uh, your restaurant staff, you know, um, you know, having really good personal hygiene, um, even seeing them clean, um, high touch services even during rush hour i think these are good indications that this restaurant is doing their due diligence to keep uh, the spread of the virus mm. thank you trish so i have a couple of questions um yes you will be able to receive the slides and the recording so this will be shared as a follow-up by email to all the people that registered to this uh, webinar so it will be directly in your mailbox you will receive a link to access the slides and the recording. We have additional questions. So um, as people return to offices, do you see them choosing to eat more in office cafeterias or will they continue to go out to food service establishments for lunch? Yeah, again, this is another prediction that is quite hard to see because even for us, um, I'm thinking how are we ever going to, even from a, you know, me as a mental employer, it's also really quite hard to anticipate what's likely to happen. Um, do we really need the five crets that are currently, lo you know, conveniently located around the Mintel office, for example? That These are questions that we need some time, um, you know, to we need some more time to really understand the market and what what's likely to happen because it doesn't look likely that um when you say going back to work and if, if you're talking about office work in the city locations that doesn't look likely to happen in the, in the next few months possibly maybe later this year so i think we need a little bit more time to understand but in in terms of cafeteria i think if anything it could play to its strength because it is all being self-contained if you again uh, show and demonstrate what you're doing, what you're putting in place for hygiene. It actually makes more sense to um, just, you know, encourage and invite more people to stay in one location rather than, you know, moving around to different venues outside, uh, you know, death, uh, you know, uh, the risk of exposing yourself to catching something. So it could actually work to your favor, but again, it needs a little bit more time to play out. So I think um, I, I'm quite hopeful for uh, in-house cafeterias, actually. Mm. Actually, Trish, it's a, a good, because we have, we have several questions regarding um, catering, so catering division, you know, people who are working um, in office catering. So do you see similar trends to the ones that, you know, you, you've presented to us 
extending into the contract catering division, for example, office catering facilities? As in, um, you mean as an in-house, like a kitchen and an in-house restaurant kind of a... Yeah, like so company, company I mean? restaurants, company, uh, company offices, restaurants. Exactly. Yeah, pretty much like what I said, because if it's, if it's, if it's all, you know, if it's, if it's all in under one roof, I think it's easier to kind of say this is our habitat and therefore we are in full control of you know, maintaining its hygiene, it just it really does kind of make more sense to encourage more people to just stay in. So um, if anything, I think it's about understanding what, you know, what consumers want. Again, uh, you know, healthy convenience. I think if, if you know, the, these, you know, like uh, the health trend is not going to disappear because of COVID-19. And then, as Jack has mentioned, if anything, Thing it's rent up. People really do care about their health, so it's really about checking in to see what consumers want. I think in this in this day and age, it's more about boosting, um, you know, immune boosting, mood enhancing. So all of these kind of elements, if you can incorporate that into your menu, and you can cater to office uh, workers, you encourage them and entice them with, you know, fresh ingredients, entice them to stay inside. I think that could work to their advantage. I, I don't see how that, yeah, I, I, I actually am quite hopeful for um, uh, contract catering in establishments. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, Trish. I have actually um, a question which might refer to your trend regarding technology. Um, it is, did you receive any feedback um, from consumers, I guess, on totally automated services? So totally automated services so um, oh, like vending machines yeah maybe vending machine or, or maybe you know the, mm. the question could could elaborate but could it be um you know vending or could it be robots um mm. yeah so this this is probably something you know it, we can shift our eyes and look towards china and see what they are doing as well so robots have really come to the fore so they're they're you know cleaning robots they've, they've been there, they've done that now. It's about all the other touch points from serving, taking orders, making drinks, cooking. So all of these robotics are definitely going to come to the fore in the coming months, years. Let's get let's just be more realistic. In the coming years, I think th these would be uh, definitely one to watch. However, when we ask questions about robotic uh, chefs, for example, cooking or making drinks, the UK consumer is still a little bit averse towards it. They, they're not quite accepting. They do um, understand the benefits of that. They do understand that it's a more hygienic um, option, but they really still want to see chefs cooking. So it's really about prepping your chef, making sure that they are doing their due diligence to make sure that they are not spreading any virus uh, to amongst themselves, to the food or to the customers. So that's more important. I think the human element is still very, very strong in the UK. But if you look at China, that's probably a market that's really quite innovative, that's really innovating around robotics and totally get yeah, automation. I think that's that's one market to look at. Thank you so much, Trish. We do have uh, more questions regarding um, eating in the workplace. Um, so so one of the questions is, is there, do we have more data on eating in the workplace? Oh. It's fair. Not at this moment. I think it's going to be a little bit tricky to do that research. We need a few more months, and I'm pretty sure we will. So I would invite you to check in with Mintel if you're not already subscribers. Uh, yeah, do check in with us. We can definitely keep, uh, you know, keep this conversation going because it is quite important to understand the kind of uh, behaviors that we're going to adopt when we go back to the offices. But because we're still quite far away from that vision, it's a little bit hard to predict because. Yeah, it's really counting on, you know, people's intentions. That can sometimes be a little bit swayed, as we've seen earlier about their intention to cut back um, from going out to fast food restaurants. So the intention might be really stark, like I do not intend to eat out. But the thing is, it, 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 we still need some time for the market to mature, for, for, for the whole situation to settle a little bit more. So I would say, yeah, watch the space and check in with us in a couple of months' time. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Trish. So perhaps, you know, time for, for one or two more questions. So if you still have a, a question, feel free to, to write it in the question box. I have an, a last question, I mean, a before last question, uh, again, regarding a workplace. Um, in the workplace, will the caterer deliver lunches to the client's workstation instead of the customer going to the restaurant? So like, um, it's like, like almost like a delivery uh, straight to a uh, to the open space instead of you know you know people going to restaurants. Do you see something like this, Trish? I have seen this um, in news. For example, when I look at say Chinese news or you know Asian news, there really is a lot of innovation in that area as well. So robotic delivery, um, uh, those yeah little delivery robots. So you've got food and and it's coming through the aisle to each you know um, at each point and you can pick up your meals. So we are seeing a lot of that. But then again, it's the accessibility to these kind of in these kind of robots. So um, it's likely that uh, people might, even, even for, for our office, we're also plotting our reopening strategy. Um, and we're also thinking, can we still resume our normal behavior of, uh, you know, that clean desk format where we, we sit, uh, we, we, you know, we, we're hot desking. Can we still hot desk in this situation? It's looking unlikely that hot desking will, will remain. So we might have to uh, go back to the days where we are allocated a space. So it's really about being allocated to a space, staying in that space and and really optimizing, maximizing that space experience. So that contract caterer, for example, it is in a controlled environment, in a space, and therefore it makes sense to kind of either bring it, you know, the, the, the logistics of whether the food's being brought to you or whether you go out to, as long as there is some kind of a guidelines, I think it can really work because if you adopt that kind of restaurant mindset into it, when you think, all right, if everyone's gonna keep two meters apart, then we need to have a bit of crowd control who's going to go and pick up their meals, at what time maybe you have to stagger those collection time, pick up point, pick up times. These, again, you know, it's, it's basically based on what I've talked about, uh, looking at those examples that I've listed as indicators and how it can inspire you to adapt some of these ideas into your own um, guidelines, for example. So, yes, yeah, social distancing, staggered timings, whether it's collection or whether it's delivery, that can be something that, you know, you can, uh, you know, yeah, I think that these finer details can be worked out closer to the launch date, but it's more important to, um, to really kind of work out what you're going to put in the menu, how you're going to cater to people, um, in a, you know, how you're going to show that you're doing your due diligence to, to prevent mm. spread. Thank you so much, Trish. So we have a few more questions, but I'm just going to, to go quickly. So we have one question regarding um, whether or not we see an increase of intention of consuming certain foods such as related to immune support. So yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I've been writing quite a lot on it. So if you go on intel.com, we have, a, there's a blog and our blog has been, we have been writing quite a lot about immunity, some of the opportunities, but also that's something that, um, we could, we could support you, uh, um, on an individual basis in the future because, uh, we are covering quite a lot, um, the immune, the immune area and, and the opportunities at Mintel with our clients. Um, and then I have a, a very, I have two really, really good questions. Uh, one which is quite, quite uh, wide. So again, um, perhaps we can come back to you um, on, on that, which is like, do we see the hospitality um, industry changing for the better in the future? And what can we do to support our consumers along the journey? So that's quite a big question um, to, to answer. So I'm sorry, maybe I'm going to focus with one last question before wrapping up, which is um, actually regarding morning breakfast and cafes offering. Um, I don't know if Trish or Jack, you have some thoughts on that, but are consumers more likely to have breakfast at home? I certainly, certainly do. <laughs> Um. um Jack, do you want to chime in on breakfast behaviors eating at home? Um I, Mintel I, I, did a lot of yeah. We we yeah. always love talking about breakfast, don't we? <laughs> it's like uh millennials don't like to wash up. <laughs> so they're not. But do you have anything to add, Jack? I don't have any specific numbers on breakfast. I actually chiming on something you said a minute ago though, Trish, that I thought was interesting. It's about the idea of days <laughs> becoming more planned, uh, mm -hmm. and that making less convenience might change in position slightly to be more about um, 
to be more about how it fits within a plan rather than just being there at the right time. So Trisha's point in there, do we need five prets? I think what I think is interesting is if people are thinking more about their day, then I think there'll be a stronger breakfast market, but potentially from the consumer goods perspective rather than the out of home. Because it'll be if I'm going to the office only once or twice a week, which is looking like it could be possible for many companies looking forward, then I will plan that day out quite carefully. That, that might mean that I'm more likely to go to a food service out restaurant, but it might also mean Oh, I just need to prepare one lunch this week. I may as well do it. So that there are some challenges there. I think I agree with Trish that canteens might benefit from it in terms of reducing exposure. But breakfast, I think it might it might more be to the benefit of the in-home breakfast market as well. That would be my inclination at this point. Great, thank you so much. So Carolina, would you like to say the last word? Words, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to repeat that the webinar, apart from uh, getting you getting the, the deck and the recording by email, everything was also going to be uh, saved, hosted in the, the Nestlé Professional website and the, under the Always Open For You banner. So look for it there, if not. And, and also, if you think that it, it had a very good content, please do share the link with any colleagues that you have in at, at your teams. Uh, and I wanted just to thank a lot, Mintel, for all the work done to put this webinar together, and also to all of you for joining us. So I think that probably the thought to finish um, the, the webinar today is that COVID-19 has accelerated the trends that we've seen already taking place from before. But then consumer and shopping habits are changing and uh, operators, retailers and suppliers are transforming their businesses, business models as fast as they can to satisfy the emerging needs and also to follow consumers where they are. So uh, a, a key message I think that from me is that agility and adaptability are crucial for the future and the challenging times that we have ahead of us. So. Uh, thank you, and I hope that you found uh, good ideas, inspirational points, and uh, a lot of very good insights in in the in the in these times that we have today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a really good day, and please share any feedback you might have. Bye, everyone.